Good evening, I'm DK Ronsna. Welcome back to the GTT News. We continue to look at the landscape that exists and try to forecast some aspects of the upcoming budget presentation. This evening, we dive deep into agriculture with former MP and a former Minister of Agriculture, Vasant Bharath. Welcome, Mr. Bharath. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. And thank you for having me on the program. Our pleasure. But it, we are into budget mode now. So looking at what we can be expecting from the budget. And I'm glad that we're able to kind of bear in on agriculture with you. But looking at the trends that we would have seen of recent budgets passed and possibly even the, the spike of last, what are some of those things that you see? in terms of projections and eventual spends with regard to the budget as it pertains to agriculture? Well, I think if you look at uh, the la over the last 10 years, you will see that uh, when the People's Partnership came into office, we actually ramped up uh, the budgetary allocations for agriculture. I think in the first year, 2010-11, uh, the budget would have been in the region of about $1.9 billion. And then um, across the four-year period subsequent to that, um, I believe, from, if memory serves me correctly, it was in a region of about $1.3, $1.4 billion, because we uh, clearly had articulated in our manifesto and in the run-up to the election that agriculture was pivotal as far as uh, retaining the country to some sense of food security and food sovereignty and the ability to feed ourselves, of course. Um, I noticed Obviously, um, like most people, with a, with a great sense of alacrity and, uh, and concern that from 2016 onwards, uh, you saw a gradual uh, decrease in the allocations for agriculture. I think at one point in time in 2017, 2018, that figure actually went down to about $500 million. So it would have been about a third of what traditionally uh, had been allocated in the prior, in the previous five years. It's, it was bumped up a little bit subsequently to around about between seven and eight hundred million dollars. And then of course last year, um, an additional uh, uh, fill-up of 500 million was promised to the sector. Um, based on that track record, I don't see uh, much more being allocated to the sector than has been in the last five years. Uh, and unfortunately, what that does, it, it, it sends um, an incorrect and inappropriate message to farmers of the country um, and to citizens generally that we are going to continue to be dependent uh, on food imports, which, as you may know, accounts for about uh, 80 to 85 percent of what we consume in Trinidad. Now, what COVID-19 um, shone a direct light on and focused on was uh, well, three things. Um, predominant, no, none of which were rocket science that we didn't know before, but three things predominantly. Uh, the first was, of course, our over-dependence on uh, the energy sector. Uh, the second was our over-dependence on imported food and the need to um, diversify in more into uh, agriculture. And third was the inequities in our society with regard to things like healthcare, affordable homes, um, women and children who suffer from domestic violence and so on. But I'm I like very concerned that we seem not to have addressed many of those situations, nor uh, implemented several of the recommendations uh, that were made by the Roadmap Committee, particularly as we're talking about agriculture. And there were several of those, uh, because the, uh, the problems that existed, have existed in agriculture for the last 50 years are the same ones that uh, are present today. Of course, it's even more important today because of uh, what's happened with supply chain management uh, and the ability to get food into Trinidad and Tobago, the possibility of escalating prices now that we see with regard to freight and uh, other raw materials. Um, and, and so there were a number of measures that we talked about that in the Roadmap Committee that have existed for the last 50 years, as I said. And even, be, and even before you get into some of those things, Mr. Barrett, I'm, I'm grateful yes. you're able to speak to the Roadmap Committee, and, and most likely we'll ask, we'll dive into that in a little bit, but sure. with regard to COVID shining a light on certain things, do you think that the trend is still one that is 
possibly disappointing, for want of a better word, with regard to the signal being sent to the agriculture sector, especially since this light has been shone and people are speaking about it more in a manner that goes towards getting something done. Because sometimes we, people can speak about something and say, okay, well, we should. And, you know, it would make sense if, as opposed to saying, okay, well, what are those incremental steps? So even before we get too far down the line of policy, how does the pandemic impact local agriculture? Well, clearly, uh, raw material inputs are significant in the agricultural sector. Because of course, all our seedlings are imported generally. Um, all of our fertilizer is imported. Um, and so therefore, we are essentially competing with a country for example. And, and, and the other aspect of our agriculture that puts us at a disadvantage is that our agriculture in Trinidad and Tobago is predominantly very labor intensive. So let me give you a good example here. I visited Costa Rica back in 2011 as a guest of the Costa Rican Minister of Agriculture. And I was very surprised because I obviously was new to agriculture myself. I was very surprised that, uh, let's say an acre of land that we would grow um, 10,000 uh, pounds of tomatoes on in a particular season, the Costa Ricans on that same parcel of land was, were growing 60,000 uh, pounds of tomatoes. And it actually was the same for all of the other fruits and vegetables that were growing. And the reason that were, they were able to do that was with the use of technology. Okay, They were able to use technology to understand the physiology of the plant and to actually uh, fertilize the plant with the exact fertilizer that the plant needed at every stage of its development rather than just spraying a general fertilizer um, when, if and when you have time. Even watering of the plant was done at specific time intervals based on the physiology of the plant. And a tomato plant might require a different amount of watering, watering at a different time than uh, uh, you know, another, another product, a, a cucumber, for example. And what we have not done in Trinidad well is that we've not addressed the issue of technology that would then in turn increase the yields and then also in turn encourage young people to want to get involved in a sector that's not back breaking and it's not seven days a week sun or rain, but it actually is a genuine profession where they can earn a decent living and have a good quality of life. So I think those are some of the signals that were actually flagged in the roadmap committee that needs to have been put in place, at least the basis and the foundation needed to have been put in place. You see, the biggest problem we have in this country is that we don't engage enough with the stakeholders who are the people who are affected uh, by what we're doing in government. I do not believe that the farmers of this country has had any level of engagement with the government over the last six years, or any meaningful engagement. The government may have made certain statements, but they've not really meaningfully engaged. And just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, uh, in 2010, when I became a uh, Minister of Agriculture, I actually engaged 86 farmers groups from across the country for a two-day session at a hotel in South, where we, I sat down with them. And the reason I engaged them from across the country was simply soil types are different, uh, challenges are different, depending on where you are, and where you live and where you plant. And we engaged these 86 farm, 86 farming groups. We had over 150 people representing these groups uh, for a two-day session, talking about the problems that they had, talking about the challenges, and talking about the solutions of what they thought for people who were living it on a daily basis. What were, what were the fixes that they had to find to be able to keep the agriculture sector going? And so when I wrote, uh, and I'll show you, when, I, when, when the Ministry of uh, Food Production wrote this document, which is the National Food Production Action Plan for 2012 to 2015, this actually came out of the belly of the farmers from those discussions and those consultations. So everything that was in here as to how we would proceed to develop and build a sector was actually from the farmers themselves. So they bought into the document and they bought into what we were doing, hence the reason why we had such great success in a very short space of time with that two-year period. And in terms of buying in, one of the things I want to ask on the other side of the break is how has the perception of agriculture changed to you 
uh, among people who are not necessarily traditionally from that farming background. But we, gui we dive into that when we return. This is In Depth with me, DK Rosner. We are speaking with Vasant Bharat. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We are speaking with Vasant Bharat about the forecast for the upcoming budget with an eye specifically on agriculture. And just before we took the break, Mr. Bharat, uh, one of the things I was asking about is whether or not the impact of the pandemic, the fact that you have more people planting stuff in a bottle, a Jalita bottle, backyard farming, according there's somebody who coined the term yardening. So they're in the yard, but at the same time, they're producing something as opposed to trying to get everything at the farm, everything at the supermarket, and therefore realizing the importance a little more of growing things. Because I'd say I have the experience of every Corpus Christi. You put something in the earth, you have some corn and some, and some, and some pigeon peas, and you do a little of this, a little of that, but making sure that there's a little more consistent. What are some of those opportunities that you see at this point in time, be it because of the disruption of the pandemic or just the fact uh, we are in a different time? Well, we're certainly in a different time in terms of affordability. And a lot of people, as you know, they have lost their jobs. Uh, a lot of people are working reduced hours. There's less income coming into the pool. And so wherever people can find a way to save money um, and eat healthily, um, they ought to be doing that. But again, there needs to be far greater communication with the population in terms of the things that they can do on their own. A lot of people are just uh, are just ignorant of what is required. I, mean, I use the word ignorant not in the Trinidadian term, but in the, in the real English term. They just don't know what to do. Um, we had started a program in 2011 whereby in the urban areas we started giving out grow boxes because many people live in these high-rise um, apartments and they don't have access to land. But with grow boxes, you can actually grow tomatoes, you can grow cucumbers, you can grow uh, quite a few fruits and vegetables um, and, and, and seasonings and so on. And we started giving those out free to people to try to encourage them together with the seedlings and so on. I noticed that program has, uh, has stopped as well. But it need, it's a continuous stream of education and communication that needs to be fed to people until it becomes culturally accepted accepted and acceptable to them and it becomes part and parcel of, parcel of their day-to-day -day living but in addition to that we also need to start to talk about why it's important for farmers to grow more food in trinidad and tobago and why it's important for citizens to support local farmers because at the end of the day we are competing at the point at this point in time with tomatoes coming in from costa rica or apples coming in from the United States, or grapes coming in from other parts of the world, those are competing against our products. Freight and duties are being paid on those products and landing in Trinidad cheaper than we are producing it. Now that has to do with the economies of scale and our inability to use technology appropriately and our lack of access to export markets and so on. Now, what we need to do with agriculture in Trinidad and Tobago is to encourage it in the same way that we encourage Point Lisas as a sector that was important to the country and we needed to develop it. And whatever incentives we needed to put towards it, whatever focus, whatever, whatever human resources we required, we would be there to, to support it in the, in, in the interim and to bring more and more people into, into the process of growing their own food and buying more locally produced foods. And I don't think that we have had that emphasis for the longest while in the sector. And uh, every country in the world today, DK, is now looking at food security because they clearly understand uh, what took place during the pandemic. And no country wants to be in a position where they're unable to feed them. So countries that are producing food are looking to make sure that their people are fed first before they export uh, that produce. And, uh, you know, as I say, uh, more and more people are looking at homegrown rather. And of course, there's this, there's a vital issue, of course, uh, the critical issue, of course, of saving foreign exchange as well. So uh, these are really serious issues that I hope the government is uh, putting its mind to attending to in the budget um, of, uh, of next week. And I'd be very disappointed indeed if you see, it's not just a question of the monies that are being allocated. You could allocate two billion dollars to agriculture. But if uh, 
1.5 billion is spent in administrative costs on salaries and traveling and so on. So very little of it gets into the fields and into the farmers' hands. And that's where we're going to have the problem. We, it's, a, it's, it's also holding the farmer's hand for a period of time, showing them what is possible. I, I just showed you the Agriculture Now plan, right? But I want to also show you another document that we have produced, and it's called Investments, uh, Investment Opportunities in Agriculture. And here it is. And what we did was for uh, maybe about eight or 10 uh, agricultural items, we identified what the local market was. So let me give you an example, very quickly. Uh, it, let's say the investment profile is on tomatoes. We did an industry overview of what the industry in Trinidad and Tobago for tomatoes was. We did an uh, overview of what how much was being produced. We did an overview of how much is the, how much is exported currently, where the markets were exporting to, where the potential markets uh, were exporting to, and gave and, and, and told them uh, and, and in the book that it talks about uh, the, the fact that there is a potential. Um, that could be facilitated in the US, Canada, Panama, Costa Rica, and Paraguay. So, and we did this for tomatoes, we did it for cucumber, we did it for dashi, for peppers, and everything. So, here you had uh, not just telling the farmer to grow more through this and showing him how to do it, here you had along the chain giving the farmer an idea of what he can do if he grew more and what the potential of the market was. And I think that is what needs to be done more. It needs to be handled like a, like a business process from beginning to end. There is going to be some handholding initially, but I think eventually people will be able to branch out on their own and it becomes a, uh, second nature uh, to the farmers of the country. And more and more people, of course, will want to get involved once they see success is happening in Trinidad. And in terms of that hand holding, you said you, you've mentioned a lot of things that I want to kind of group them together to ask the next question. Uh, dealing with economies of scale or against them, uh, engaging with stakeholders, having that hand held as we move or transition from one methodology to another. And looking at the current status of agriculture and implications for agriculture policy and strategy, you also spoke about that level of communication that is necessary. What are some of those things that you suggest can be used to even increase the value chain? Because if you're looking, and, and we go back to the example of tomatoes, so coming from Costa Rica is much cheaper than having them produced in Trinidad and Tobago. Is there a way that we can increase our output, the value of that output, so we're not just trying to uh, compete with tomatoes for tomatoes, as opposed to a value-added product, be it a paste, be it a concentrate, be it sun-dried, and uh, just carry that forward. So it's not as though we just pulling something out of the ground, shaking the dirt off, and then trying to get a price for it that competes with something that it can't, the way that it is set up at this point in time. Okay, so I have recommended in the roadmap uh, committee um, for agriculture that in the initial instance, farmers be paid a guaranteed price for produce that we identify as being critical. So uh, you could select eight or 10 items, and I mentioned tomatoes and cucumbers, and you could, it could be any type, cassava, dashi, whatever it is. And you say to the farmer at the beginning of the year of the season uh, that for the next three seasons, and you identify these farmers based on good farming practices. So it's not like open to the, to the entire country to start with, but you're hoping to pull the entire country into the into concentric circles subsequently. But you identify maybe eight or ten or a dozen farmers, and you say, "Listen, uh, I'm going to give you a guaranteed price for dashi, for pumpkin, for this, for that, or the other." Right? Um, the price is. Five dollars a pound. You produce as much as you want, and I will pay you five dollars a pound. You produce as much tomatoes as you want, I'll pay you eight dollars a pound. So the farmer, before the season begins, knows that his cost of production is three dollars, but he's getting a guaranteed price of eight dollars. Now, what does that do? What that does is that in the event, what happens currently is if tomato prices go up to eighteen dollars, everybody jumps into the market, grows tomatoes. By the time the crop is ready to be to be um, uh, put, uh, picked, uh, the price of tomatoes goes down to $5. So the farmer loses money. So you have what's called peaks and troughs in the, in the agricultural sector. One day tomatoes is up there, the consumer suffers, and the farmer gains, and the next day it drops like this, the consumer benefits, and the farmer is, uh, loses up. 
So you have an agency, which would, in my opinion would have been a reformed NAMDEFCO, because NAMDEFCO is essentially... And in, and in terms of that reformation process and all of these things, I'm very happy, and I'll plug it now, that we will be continuing this discussion on the day of the budget itself. Because 20 minutes, yes, we're ambitious with it, and we want to thank you for the time, both now and on October 4, when we continue this discussion with you, Mr. Vasan Barrett. And on behalf of the entire TTT News team, thank you for tuning in to In-Depth with me, DK Ronstadt.